I'm just going to begin by sharing a little anecdote. Uh, some years ago, I was sitting in a very remote village, and uh, as part of my research and conversations, developmental conversations, uh, I just threw this question and I said, "Do you all have you all heard of Gandhiji?" And uh, there was a little bit of a blank look, and then some of them nodded hesitantly, and uh, they said, "Yes." So I said, "Who is he?" So one of them very quickly said, he's God. Uh, the second one thumped her and said that, no, no, he's not God. Fir, pir, pir, fakir the. Uh, then the third one felt that that was also slightly inflated and she said, nay, nay, bhot bada admi tha. And then there was this quiet woman sitting in the corner. So I turned around and I said, and what do you think? And she said, मुझे इतना पता है everybody here understands Hindi right मुझे इतना पता है कि जो भी थे वो सरकारी आदमी नहीं थे <laughs> this uh, so from a researcher standpoint and today I uh, I think Sanjeev in his conversation with me had said that yes there'll be a lot of the young research that's going on in in VAF <laughs> so this question and the answer and the response to that was technically incorrect. But it was saying actually a lot about Gandhiji, but it was actually saying a lot about that woman. Uh, and it was really telling us about how she was representing her own experience of Sarkari Admi, which is not any Sarkari Admi, but whether development had touched her or not and whether development by the state had touched her or not. And she knew that this person we are talking about was definitely not part of that circle which had kept her out. Uh, and I think that has, this has a deep learning for a lot of us and for this discussion today. Um, when we talk about individual women and we talk about who they represent and what they represent, uh, and what do they not represent and what are they put out of, um, we often find that they are outside the circle of development, but who is speaking to them? Who is listening to them? Uh, and so I come back to the question that does the development discourse ignore women? Let's begin with women. I would say no, not today. The development discourse does not ignore women today. Um, it, it throws its gaze across a whole lot of them, homogenizes a whole range of experiences and contexts, it somewhere resists or sometimes refuses to delve deep into women's life experiences, individual life experiences, and is very content to have counted women as participants, beneficiaries, victims, case studies, but not necessarily explored the complex dynamics that she lives through every day. Uh, but three and a half decades ago, or four decades ago, they were ignored. And I think we need to see this in the context. I was sitting in the last session just now, and it was very interesting. Gurmeet had a very good presentation to make, if I got her name right. And, uh, and in her presentation, at some point, she was saying that um, there has to be, we have to look at empowerment with care. And I was thinking and said that, weren't we doing this three, three and a half decades ago? We have come somewhere a full circle, we have lost something, and we are coming back and saying this is what we need today, and that's not happening. Three and a half decades ago, women's realms of operation, all women, was pretty much ignored. Uh, it was ignored due to a lack of consciousness, I would say, a sensitivity and an understanding of patriarchy and how patriarchy expresses itself through us as individuals, through society, and through the state. Uh, but this very ignorance actually is what created the women's movement and created a very counterintuitive process um, where uh, we started looking at women's strategic needs, their practical needs, their expressions, the impact of patriarchy on their lives and their own coping mechanisms. And we believed then as a sector, as citizens, as activists, as educators, as researchers, 
that the subjective experience of each unfolded the experience of many. And that's why, because of this ignorance, we delved deep into individuals. Uh, and I remember at some point, uh, there was this one Kabir phrase which would keep getting quoted and would say, ek sadhe to sab sadhe, sab sadhe ek jai. Which means that when you're immersed in one, you're actually immersed in all. And you understand the collective experience. When you try and immerse yourself, how do you do? How do you immerse yourself in all, in so many, you actually lose that one too. Um, two decades ago, or maybe two and a half decades ago, um, or two decades later, as we are today, we have, um, I hate throwing statistics, <clears throat> but I will. We have supposedly 33, 33, 34 million women who are part of SAGs. We have discussed a lot of that in the last one hour. One women elected representatives in our panchayats. But we also have almost 20,000 women homemakers committing suicide annually in our country. Uh, this is a rate which is much higher, four times higher than the farmer's suicides, which I'm not diminishing that. But just look at, look at the way we balance these. Look at the space, the mind space, the media space, the developmental space, the research space that we, have, we, we, we give this. And we have not even acknowledged this. I remember about seven, eight years ago or 10 years ago in the region I work in and come from, Kutch, uh, we did a small study and we realized that the number of women committing suicides was higher than all the highway deaths in Gujarat. That was how high it was every year. So well, there has, there has been a huge movement. We have all these one lakh women in panchayats. We have thousands of women in SHGs. We have thousands and thousands of educators. Uh, I often say that maybe the number of people who are part of the national freedom movement may be less than what we have today in the number of people who are engaged in some kind of social action across the world, across the country. And yet, this is not enough. Something is, something is going wrong. Or maybe we are, just, we are just on a curve and a path. But what we see today is not ignorance. What we see today is a stubborn commitment to patriarchy. But, what we, but it is far more complex than that. It is not just patriarchy today. It's far more complex than that. In the 70s and 80s, women were indeed ignored and that arose from an acceptance, belief, and surrender to all the proclaimed values of patriarchy. Many people, even within the social and development sector, had not really moved uh, from patriarchal notions. Uh, and women themselves had also accepted it and continue to. Two decades of intensive societal work on replacing all these values of patriarchy with values of empowerment, amongst women at least, has exposed many fault lines. However, in this new millennium, we have quickly moved from working on transforming gender power equations to decorating and celebrating and embellishing the idea of women's empowerment devoid of its true meaning. And that is the crux of the problem. This has become today more a way of expressing solidarity and enhancing one's own credibility and power on being on the right side of gender. Gender optics is what I call it. And to a large extent, as somebody was just, we were just discussing this in the last session, uh, what, I really, what I'm really expressing here is really pointers, questions, questions to myself, self-reflections. This is a sector which has started flitting, picking up droplets from, from different regions to enhance one's own experience. I am, of course, exaggerating. I'm here to exaggerate. So that we push the point. And I will again quote a Kabir poem, a Doha, which says, Bhavra bilma baag mein bau phoolan ki aas. Bhavra ghoom rahi hai sab jagah pe, bhoat sari jagah se le rahi hai, because there's such a desire. You are, you, one is going here, one is going there, one is going here. We are, what, what happens at the end of it? We are homogenizing. 
why are we roaming? Why are we flitting? Why are we not capturing the ways in which development and women's well-being, not empowerment alone, are not overlapping? They have, but they're also not. And let us just look at different scenarios, and I just want to continue to look at these overlaps of development as we name it. I'm not getting into the discussion of all the growing paradigms of what development is. We accept a general framework and understanding that it means socio-economic, cultural, ecological well-being. Uh, and I'd like to just quickly share some different examples where women have fallen out of the circle of well-being, of self-actualization, dignity, and self-esteem. Um, just about a month ago, I was in a fairly remote village of Karnataka uh, with a community called the Kadu Golas. I don't know many of you would be familiar with them. They're the Golas, but they are the forest Golas. And I was quite shocked. I went into this village, and these are herders uh, who have moved on. They have done economically. They have actually d diversified their economic livelihoods. And as I walked into their habitats, um, they have fairly large houses, uh, and then they have courtyards, and then they have walls, compound walls to their houses. And outside the walls, there are these little platforms. And as I walked through that, there were girls sleeping on these platforms. I kept going through the lanes, and there were these girls sleeping, some were studying, some were working, some were sitting. And I found this very strange, and I, I just intuitively went and asked one of them that, is this because you are menstruating? And she said, yes. And then we had a deep discussion on this, with these girls who were so scared to say why they were sleeping out. So I said, this is, and what do you do in the night? They said, no, we are here. For three, four days, we are here on these platforms outside our compound walls of our own homes. And what happens when it rains? Oh, when it rains in cold, in heat, in wind, in storm, we are outside. There is no way we will be taken in. If there is what, if there is rain, then somebody will come and maybe give us something to put over it. So I said, what happens when women are <coughs> delivering? And then they showed me this other spot in the habitat where there were two women. And they were sitting there. And they are there. They are there for at least three weeks, one month, out. Uh, and they said, now things are changing a little. For pregnant women, sometimes shelter is given, sometimes. This is today. <coughs> This is not a community <coughs> not touched by development. <coughs> their houses were evidence of it. Their, the way they were looking at their livelihoods, their animal breeds, their practices, they were aspirational. They had moved on. But this was an area, this was a region where development had encircled the community but had not led to the well-being of the women and girls. Then we go to another community <coughs> of, and there are many of these across the country. I've been increasingly working a lot with pastoral communities and groups uh, who keep moving. And um, invariably I find, as one would find in tribal areas, so I'll give you the example of the Lombardi community in Telangana, where they used to have very clearly actually a bright price, where uh, if at all, there would be a bright price earlier. At some point, it equalized. And today, there are huge dowries. And these have been very quick transformations. And the story is similar across the country where people in movement, people who are living off the commons, whether they were forests, whether they were, um, uh, I, I don't know, Vivek, maybe whether in the coastal regions, it, it's there. <coughs> very high. Not dowry, dowry. Yes, I'm talking about what existed earlier. Yes. So, and this has been my understanding, my observation, and my learning across the country, that where communities lived off the commons, the gender relations were fairly, f fairly progressive and equal. And something happened in the last 15, 20 years, more clearly in the last 10 years, where suddenly, the equation has shifted, and you find 
huge dowries. It's it is huger than what would normally exist. There are huge pressures. There are high rates of suicides by young girls. In, in fact, in our own region, I was shocked to find that Rabaris, who are very progressive, robust women, and I suddenly found a whole range of 13, 14 year old girls committing suicides in the community. And that's because these girls now realize that their parents would have to pay huge dowries and they were not equipped to do that. So this now is an example where patriarchy very clearly rides the developmental trends. It drives alongside, it goes leading to diminished well-being of girls. So you have the so-called development parameters and where contemporary notions of development have entered which are largely economic, you will find patriarchy riding alongside it in a very aggressive way. And then we have hundreds of examples across, but this I saw. <laughs> Poor women in Ahmedabad displaced due to the famed river fund project find themselves living next to the municipal dumps and gutter lines and the state of pregnant women there who are living there on the edges next to this dump only because the city was going to celebrate a riverfront. A clear case, and we have thousands of this, neglected and relegated outside the circle because of development. And what do we have to say of all the young girls in Kashmir, the old mothers, the traumatized widows, where development has been jettisoned completely because of civil strife? Who is talking about them? We're talking about the civil strife. We're talking about other issues. Who is really talking about the emotional, psychological experiences of individual women here across? It does not even come within our developmental framework because there's something else happening there. Kashmir is just one space. We have many such across the country. And then, of course, the most familiar to all of us, where women and girls bear the brunt of lack of housing, water, nutrition, healthcare, education, because development itself has not reached them. And then you have in a pocket of 40 villages in Jharkhand, which also I was visiting a few months ago, where in a small cluster of uh, 40 villages, I found there was a girl from every house in that habitat who were being trafficked. There was one girl, this is unbelievable, there was one girl in that entire habitat from every household who was there, who, was, who had been trafficked, been brought back in some cases, or had gone through the experience of trafficking. Here, girls are sold for dreams of development and well-being. So you see a range of overlaps, interlaps between development and the well-being of girls and women. And then in rural India, where we have these one lakh women panchayat leaders, where we have so many, I, I work a uh, fair degree with local governance institutions, panchayats especially, and in village after village you will find, and this again is across, that there will be huge cases of domestic abuse and violence, but those will never be taken up by the panchayat. Local governance institutions do not think domestic violence against women or female forticide fill falls within their domains of local governance. These are either relegated to the women's mandal or to the local punch or to the legal system, not to the social justice committees of the local governance institutions. They're completely out of that. This is where we don't even see that the well-being of women and girls is actually part of governance. <laughs> Development is, but not this. Um, I just want to now raise a few questions. Let's begin with research and researchers. With research, rather than making women as objects of inquiry, would we do better to make them the primary agents of inquiry? They are our respondents often. But what are their questions? We take questions to them. But what are their questions? What are their hypotheses about their own lives? What aspects of their experiences would they like society to understand? This girl I saw sleeping on the platform asked me this question. She said, nobody is curious why we are living like this. We are here to listen to them, not as respondents alone, 
but as those posing questions, our research would actually become far more located in how they are experiencing development or the lack of it. Women's lives are of course deeply impacted by development neglect, we all know that. But when we look at development neglect, women's life world and experiences are often subsumed under the starker and larger, larger neglect of the entire community. So if one is, one is always talked about Golas, Lombardas, the tribal, the, um, the Seherias, you're talking about the entire community and the complete neglect of well-being and development within regions, within geographies, within locations. And to start looking only at women and only at the gender angle, I'm not talking from SHGs or from the action point of view, but from a point of view of research and policy. There is a strong feeling within the sector, I find often, that you take away the gaze from the larger issues of the larger community. And so specificities will take away the larger questions and therefore you, you either subsume it or you dilute it or you neglect it. However, women's lives are equally impacted by the outcomes of development as we saw and development pursuits. We look at development directions and its unperceived impacts on women's lives, identities and expressions. In today's India, which celebrates empowerment, which, uh, which we want to celebrate how, how, how much we have done, how much the social sector has got sensitized to women. In today's day, if you are going to talk about impact of women by development, you are anti-development. And this, this is a disease that is spreading in the sector where you don't want to really ask the really uncomfortable questions of how development is impacting women's lives. Because if you do and you focus on that specificity, you suddenly are taking the gaze away from something which you need to celebrate about. Uh, I'm sure you faced that with your bathing study and the research that you did. The growing violence against women and girls, today it, it's no longer easy to, to to put it under wraps, it's all over uh, since six years. But are we even looking at the perversions that violence is facing? The use of social media and its impact on really perverted forms of violence on really young girls and adolescent girls. I have found, I have found fathers sitting with their young daughters in, in the edges of slums in larger villages, larger villages where they are getting their young daughters to actually replicate the pornographic acts that they are watching. This, this is happening, this is happening in our country. Would we want to talk about this? And then when we as civil society partners, for instance, I will go to a completely different realm, how, man, how many communities, social sector, organizations, civil society actors, the states are working on Forest Rights Act hmm? across the tribal belt. Of course, the tendency is to go more for individual forest rights. Are we even asking women as a category, as a group, what they think of individual forest rights without CFRAs? Or are we subsuming their own understanding and the perspective and interest in the larger questions we are asking the larger group? So there are many questions that we need to raise and ask on how women are watching this development, how women are viewing, not only being impacted by it, because they are being impacted by it. And then it is equally ironic that even as society has become more ethnocentric, ethnocentric and identity politics in our country today plays itself out very assertively across spaces, women as a category are getting completely homogenized. It's true that in the early decades of women's movement, and this is true three, two, three decades ago, even two decades ago, when those of us who began our work with women, I admit that we actually, given a choice, we would homogenize women's issues and concerns. We would go into depth into looking at the individual aspects and somebody was asking this question of doing gender audits of regions and power equations, yes, that would happen. 
But once that would happen and then women would come together, because there was such a large battle out there with patriarchy, one would ensure that the collectives would stay together, that women would stay together as a collective, and you don't really draw attention to the fault lines within the collectives of women, within their caste. It would happen, it would happen in your closed spaces, but outside you would be a collective. We would talk about women's experiences, though we would know internally that they would be very specific ethnocentric experiences. Uh, and this continued till at some point we realized that this has become a way. <laughs> and the more global our developmental paradigm became, the more global the civil society aspirations have become, the more we are homogenizing a lot of our terms and we have homogenized women's experiences in a huge way. The category of women or communities or human beings is by itself pluralistic. So treating women as a homogeneous group will only result in completely vacuous theorizing. And therefore, it's, it's very critical to localize women's needs, issues, strengths, and perspectives as a necessary step in reversing this neglect. If grassroots action research and policy is inherently local, then it would be difficult to ignore women's perspectives, individual women's needs, unless, of course, we are so soaked in patriarchy. It would be impossible not to recognize those individual needs if we really localize our research and action. And yet, we want to collectivize our findings, we want to collectivize our research, because the state will only listen to collective experiences. Advocacy is possible only if you homogenize. Who is, who is going to look at individual experiences? And I think as a community, as a community of practitioners, we really must pause and ask, how much advocacy have we really achieved? <laughs> how much have we sacrificed in trying to be advocates and trying to put statistics forward which homogenizes experiences and which has taken away, which has led you to put this topic today up here? Uh, how much do we balance advocacy and our own relationships with these life experiences, which is what actually empowers us and them. And how much of vacuous advocacy, which throws statistics, how much of that is actually de-empowering us and, and the communities, and the community of women. Now I come to another point. Women's empowerment has become such a significant marker of progress in any society and country. That no one will dispute, and it has always been in different ways. But today, more so. You look at any parameters of governance and gender will be up there. And this has probably been a consequence of the women's movement also. That today this has become such a significant marker to assess an indicator of good governance. But from carrying the burden of a community's prestige, women are always carried the izzat of the community and the society and the religion, they now carry the izzat of the country of nation states. <laughs> and so, in a country which is aspiring, where is that, the country's izzat is very important, are you going to open up, uncover, unfold the mess that is lying across regions and across countries? Are we, are you going to risk that? If you are not going to risk that, then individuals are going to stay out of the development discourse. And then, uh, I will not speak too much about it because we spoke for one hour about this in the last hour, on the SHG movement. This, this process of organizing women into collectives has into economic units, largely, they have become economic units, has been both the strength and dilution of our gender understanding, of our gender understanding. It's time we revisited the SHG spaces completely, renamed them, re reformulated them completely, and go and look back a little historically. For many young researchers today, they probably don't know how the, the concepts of SHG began in the late 80s or early 90s. But we must remind ourselves that this was a public space where women engaged privately. That was its significance where women merged their public and private persona. It insulated them from society's institutions 
and allowed themselves to open up with each other. That was the space. That they also happened to save and give credit was incidental. Uh, it insulated them from so it in allowed them to engage with the world as a collective. It was a strategy. This is no longer now a strategy. Barring some rigorous samples by committed organizations and women's collectives, the movement has basically created maybe huge economic opportunities, but not stunted processes which brought out the emotional, it has stunted the processes which has brought out the emotional, psychological, socio-cultural and ecological worldviews and well-beings of women. Women have largely been left out because of focusing on only their reproductive issues or their economic issues. By and large, if you were to assess the entire sector and look at what, what is the volume of research on women's issues, you will find either it's focusing on her reproductive role and her body or on her role as a worker and her economic role. The rest is completely elided. The sector and those engaged with the women's movement especially, my ilk, need to reflect on a core fallout of women achievers from amongst the poor who battle patriarchy and forms of oppression and prejudice within their families and environment daily and yet step out to transform society. We discussed this in the, in the small group an hour ago, that the multiple burdens that these women carry, they, I think somebody said that, who said that, that some woman asked, they're talking and talking to them about triple burden, and they said, yeah, triple burden, and that is true. Uh, the number of burnouts, not only amongst us, <laughs> but amongst women, only because they needed to be nurtured into the space as women who are empowered, women who are leaders, and Somewhere, the women's movement, and here I would like the women's movement to reflect. Women's movement completely lost the script at some point, where one was not looking at the, not only the heavy burden, but actually the complete loss of well-being. In fact, there's, there's a very interesting research that has happened on this, where they looked at the well-being of women and their empowerment status, and they found that those who were considered highly empowered actually suffered from and expressed very low levels of well-being. And those who were not considered very empowered actually expressed fairly high levels of well-being. Now, yes, we would, of course, also have a lot of questions on how well-being is expressed, how empowerment is expressed. Do what women express all the time, is that the right expression? Uh, one must always attribute agency to women or there is a validity to us going and identifying and indicating what is empowerment. A woman can say, if a man beats me, he's a man. Do I accept that? I don't. So not every expression is valid. But that does not mean a lot of their expressions are not valid, <laughs> even when they are not comfortable to us. At one point, like I said earlier, it was, it was almost a strategy not to highlight the fault lines within collectives. And many of us were very shocked in 2002 in Gujarat when the riots took place to see that amongst women's collectives, from women's collectives, there were tribal women and Dalit women who had attacked Muslims. And one wondered what had gone wrong. These were women's collectives who had been nurtured into spaces to, to, to nurture into sensitivities not only on their issues but all the overlapping issues of oppression. And what went wrong when there were groups from there who were springing out with swords, <laughs> uh, joining the men in a completely patriarchal drama of violence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that what one saw there, I don't think there has been a deep reflection on that in terms of research till today. The more we perpetuate this empowerment game, therefore, we are, we, it is a game today. And we are entrenching patriarchy far more deeply in terms of our definitions of power and power equations. And uh, we, need, we need to, what, how are we defining power? Are we really looking at power relations? Uh, I'm always astounded when somebody says, 
we we have empowered or i am empowered i have also heard people say i am empowered and i always thought empowered the word itself was an other centric word it actually enabled somebody to transform it was not about creating power for yourself uh, that to me was a very patriarchal definition and understanding of what power is and that is what has spread like a virus across the country i exaggerate but i deliberately do this brings me to the last point uh i especially in the last few years i wondered that does our research are we really doing research and are we collecting testimonies and are our testimonies contributing to really a referendum of how women and individual and collective voices on local regional national issues who is listening who is asking did did how how did demonetization really impact women vendors how did demonetization really impact women craftswomen um there are a range of issues that are going on across our country least of all issues of faith based violence and where are we really speaking to the women on looking at what are they facing in this what are their perspectives i i was uh, i i am sorry i'm drawing on from lot of my own conversations uh, a woman in a in a very remote village in the in the area i am in was always considered one of the most progressive families her father sent her to school this is from a very very remote very conservative uh, muslim area right on the border where nobody no women would not be are left sent out of the courtyard her dead body goes out of the courtyard uh, till about 15 years ago and even now it's not too different this girl was sent to study and did her ssc 40 years ago because her father was that progressive i hadn't met her for many years and i met her recently and she was completely poring over her quran and uh, she had pulled out her daughters her granddaughters actually from school and had sent them to a madrasa in bharuch and so i thought this warranted a conversation and i sat with her and started asking her what is happening and it was very interesting her response she said everything around me is changing i don't understand the economics i don't understand the livelihoods i don't understand markets i don't understand bhai chara ka kya ho raha hai i don't understand society i have lost all my bearings the only thing that's giving me bearing and that i understand is actually my quran and i'm going back to it which was not from my point of view not such a happy situation but from her point of view that was her well being but she was asking a question in what she was saying and the question rises that are we really creating a referendum through research through policy on what do women have to say on national issues that are going on or local or regional we are so enwrapped in trying to take them towards our own aspirations of empowerment and development who is asking them what they are thinking or what's going on there's much happening there are many conversations that's happening beyond our sg groups there are many networks that they have socially and culturally amongst themselves that in their own biradaris in their own communities our sector is not in those spaces and so we are out of that we think our spaces is where all the bright thinking is happening it's actually happening outside it uh and i come back to the last that when we're looking at a problem because researchers will always we need to look at a problem activists look at a problem but there is no such thing as a problem without a person right it's only when a problem is always a problem for someone it's not for anyone and therefore if we are not speaking enough adequately expressively comprehensively to those who are facing a problem we are not understanding the problem we are becoming the problem and i think the only way now is when a circle starts shutting you out then you have only one option of making a circle around it and begin to include you i'll stop there thank you <laughs>